Good morning. Have you ever considered what would happen if we would turn off all the satellites? If suddenly all the satellites in the sky would be turned off? Well, you would have no GPS anymore for your tom-tom in your car. Even worse, airplanes, ships in the oceans would not uh, uh, be able to position themselves. Uh, the timing of a bank transaction will be impossible. You wouldn't have any weather forecast, which for yourself would not be a big issue, but uh, for farmers or other um, sensitive industries it would. And uh, internet would, be, uh, would not exist in a number of areas, uh, telecommunication would be reduced, television would be gone. So th today there are a million things that uh, we do th thanks to uh, satellites and some of them we, uh, we almost forget them. So today what I would like to uh, talk about is not that much the satellites, the new developments, the new technologies, but really what we can do with them and how they can be uh, operated uh, even in conjunction with drones. I'll speak about drones a little bit as well. And, um, and uh, what kind of uh, uh, applications, services, businesses can be uh, used, uh, can be made, can be developed using these uh, satellites. The current situation, in fact, is that there are hundreds of satellites in the sky today, um, essentially uh, providing three types of services. Telecommunications from geostationary orbit, except for Iridium, which is actually in, uh, in LEO. Uh, precise positioning, the GPS system, GLONASS, the Russian system, Baidu, the Chinese system, and now Galileo, the, uh, the European system. And finally, Earth observation, uh, which provides all sorts of uh, observations of the planet, imagery, of course. Everybody's familiar with these images, nice images of the planet since from, uh, from space, but it's not all. They're making, uh, satellites are making measurements of all sorts of parameters on Earth, of the Earth of the oceans, of the atmosphere, of the temperature, of uh, um, every, every other parameter. So three types of services and these would enable thousands of applications. In the, in the media service, for, of course, in the oil industry, in the banking and finance sector, I've already uh, shown some applications, in the maritime sector, in transportation and logistics, in construction, in health, in utilities management, in aviation, in shipping, um, everywhere there can be applications. There already are applications of space, but again, this is an invitation. There could be many more applications uh, of, uh, of space. Many of these applications are what we call, or what, what is often referred to as uh, geoservices combination of imagery positioning and sometimes telecommunication. Let's take a look at the, the value chain of these uh, commercial applications. And here we can see three uh, lines. Again, the left communication, on the right navigation, in the middle Earth observation. And the value chain uh, goes from the upstream sector, which from our perspective is essentially uh, the space sector, the space industry, the building of, of satellites and uh, related technologies, then the launch services, then the sale of capacity uh, on satellites, and finally uh, the green part is the, the terminals and the blue uh, squares are the value-adding services. What's obvious on, uh, on this picture are two things. Number one, the value-adding services is much larger than the upstream sector. In other words, there's much more value generated by applications of space than by the space industry. And it's particularly the case for communication. Uh, essentially, uh, the upstream sector is the build-up of satellites where the value-adding services are uh, the direct TV and all these uh, connection services that uh, the satellites provide. A similar uh, picture is observed in navigation. You can see that the upstream uh, sector is uh, fairly low, just $2 billion. 
whereas the abdications, uh, the blue box, is uh, ten times larger. What's peculiar is Earth observation, where obviously there hasn't been, there's, there doesn't seem to be a lot of room for application, commercial applications and value-added services in, uh, in Earth observation. And, and one thing which has not been tested is whether the integration of the three technologies together and the combination in two services would actually uh, improve the, um, the efficiency and allow us to uh, generate new services. And that's really what, uh, I mean, this, this absence of a value-adding uh, sector and value-adding services in Earth observation was really what was in our mind when uh, we, we started uh, uh, thinking of uh, GMES and developing uh, the GMES program. Back in 2000, when uh, my team and, my, and, and I initiated the, uh, the GMES program, uh, we were essentially uh, trying to address this question. Why aren't value-adding services developing as well in Earth observation as they are in, uh, with the positioning and telecommunication satellites? And there were a number of factors which essentially had to do with the fact that um, Earth observation systems were not operational. Earth observation data were difficult to, address, to, to get and also something a bit more fundamental. Anything you want to do with Earth observation, if, or which is of substance, will require the combination of several satellites. Whereas in telecommunication, you have one telecommunication satellite, you can provide a telecommunication service to your customers. In Earth observation, actually, because the satellites are going around the planet and are not coming back to you to the same place immediately, you will need several satellites, you will need a large number of uh, satellites, a constellation, to actually uh, uh, get the information. And because you're actually looking at many different parameters, you will, have, you will require a constellation of constellations, uh, several satellites. And this is very difficult to achieve um, for a single uh, company, even for a single agency and uh, you have to look for a cooperative approach and this is really what we had in mind when we designed GMES. How could we bring together all the Earth observation resources of European countries together and uh, of uh, the private sector and public sector and the, uh, of the, uh, the European and the NASA satellites and so on. This is, this is really what, what was in our mind when, the, when we uh, initiated this uh, Global Monitoring for Environment and Security uh, program called GMES at the beginning and which has now become the operational Copernicus uh, uh, program uh, of the European Union, which uh, I'm very proud to have uh, initiated. The first Sentinel, that's the way we called the, uh, the satellites of this program, the first Sentinel was launched and became operational in October, it's, uh, it's a radar satellite at 700 kilometers with a seven years lifetime, which uh, will, uh, will provide uh, synthetic, synthetic aperture radar images of the Earth. So just for the pleasure, this is the very first image of Sentinel-1A, which was taken of uh, sea ice in the, uh, in the Arctic and which shows how the ice is, uh, is breaking and melting on its, uh, on its edge. Another uh, very uh, beautiful uh, image that these um, radar satellites can produce by a little bit of combination. It's not simply an image, it's actually a combination of several images is uh, what we call an interferogram which provide this nice uh, stripes, colored stripes which picture the deformation of the ground uh, in the area of a fault following a big earthquake in, in California, which uh, happened uh, shortly after the launch of, uh, of the, the Sentinel. But as I said earlier, the, the Sentinel is a family. It's the Sentinels. And initially we had conceived five families and, uh, and the sixth one has been added. The first one, Sentinel-1, is a radar satellite. Sentinel-2, Sentinel-2A, 
is high resolution multispectral imagery, the standard optical uh, images that uh, people are most familiar with. The third sentinel will be a continuation of the uh, uh, medium resolution observations of the ocean as well as altimetry uh, in complement to the uh, satellite, uh, the, the JSON satellite altimetry mission. Um, and the Sentinel-4 and 5 will be uh, atmospheric chemistry uh, measurements made in geostationary S4 and LEO low Earth orbit uh, uh, with S5. And finally, S6 is the continuation of the uh, JSON uh, altimetry uh, mission of the oceans, which is critical for measuring the topography of the oceans and understanding El Nino phenomena and um, developments of uh, uh, climate uh, change and global warming. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a family of satellites uh, because, uh, as I said, the, uh, uh, one of the issues was to create a constellation which would provide all the different parameters that we need to uh, to observe and also uh, provide a sufficient revisit of uh, one uh, any particular area to be able to actually uh, do something with the data uh, which uh, are meaningful for for users because users were uh, the key parameters the real objective of copernicus of, I mean, of gmes initially now called copernicus is to develop services the space component is a mean the objective in particular for the european union which is not primarily interested in uh, in in satellites uh, is the it was to develop services which could be public services to help the european union implement its uh, policies and, uh, and regulations and also private services to stimulate the economy and to make sure that uh, the European, European countries would participate in the development of these uh, geo services. That's why this G Copernicus, GMES, eventually uh, Copernicus, was the, uh, the result of a partnership with e between ESA, which developed, designed, developed and launched the satellites and the European Union, which is now going to uh, finance the continuation of this um, constellation and operate the satellites and develop the, the services. Because continuation is absolutely essential. I said earlier, one of the, uh, the reasons why the services did not develop very well in Earth observation is because, uh, because of the lack of continuity of the observations. A satellite was launched, often for demonstration or research purposes, and its lifetime was four years, five years, sometimes seven years when you're lucky, but there was no guarantee that the satellite lifetime would be extended. And this is a critical condition for developing a service, for developing um, an operational activity. You can only invest in, in developing uh, an application of a satellite if you're sure that for the next 20 years, this satellite will remain operational. So operationality, that is the continuity of the observations guaranteed for the next 10 to 20 years was something absolutely uh, essential. And the other uh, parameter is that to ha it has to be open. In other words, people should have access to the data easily. So operational and open, like O2, like oxygen, was a condition to, uh, to the success of GMES. And um, I remember writing at that time a paper called Oxygen, uh, exa exactly uh, using this, uh, these terms to, uh, to explain that uh, this was a condition for uh, the success of Copernicus. Thanks to the European Parliament, it was, um, it was achieved and uh, after several years of discussion and uncertainties there has been an agreement that the data from the Sentinels, the data from Copernicus would be made available to uh, scientific users but also to uh, the Copernicus services that the, the Commission develops as well as 
other uh, developers, uh, private companies, uh, and even international uh, partners uh, through uh, international agreements uh, implemented by the European Commission.